Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to our Medical Center Hour today, a program entitled Which Road to the Nobel Prize? This is our Walter Reed Award lecture, uh, also a lecture in the history of the health sciences. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, and happy to see you all here today. October of each year is Nobel Prize season. Every few, week, every few days in the first couple of weeks of the month come announcements of the coveted prizes for signal discoveries and achievements in a range of fields from science to literature. Quite the Oktoberfest. In 1998, physician scientist Farid Murad was one of three Americans who shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for discovery and definition of the biological effects of nitric oxide in the human body. The others were Robert Furchgott of SUNY Brooklyn and Louis Ignero of UCLA. Dr. Murad was for many years a member of the University of Virginia School of Medicine faculty. Some of us here knew him when he was in the Department of Medicine from 1970 to 1981 as director of the General Clinical Research Center and head of the Division of Clinical Pharmacology in Internal Medicine. He's now an eminent professor at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center in Houston. Dr. Murad has devoted a distinguished career in academic medicine and in industry to the study of both the mechanisms of nitric oxide and its potential therapeutic applications. In this History of the Health Sciences lecture, Dr. Murad takes us into his investigative world, introducing us to his discoveries and to the ever-growing lists of nitric oxide's actions and its potential therapeutic applications. His talk will also offer, I think, some insights into the process of doing science and of finding oneself on the road to a Nobel Prize. You'll find in your handout a description of some of what nitric oxide does in the human body, much of which we know thanks to Dr. Murad and colleagues. Among myriad other things, this colorless, odorless gas signals blood vessels to relax with the result that blood pressure decreases, no mean feet. Cell signaling continues to be a hot topic in the sciences today, again thanks in part to Dr. Murad's achievements. And who knows if future Nobel Prizes will be awarded for additional groundbreaking investigations in this area as we continue to acquire information about how information is transmitted between cells. We welcome Dr. Murad back to UVA from the University of Texas Health Science Center, where he is, and I have to take a deep breath here because he has many titles, Regental Professor and John S. Dunn Distinguished Chair in Physiology and Medicine, Texas Nobel Scholar at the University of Texas at Houston, Director Emeritus, Brown Foundation Institute of Molecular Medicine for the Prevention of Human Diseases, and director of the aforementioned Institute's Center for Cell Signaling. Before we hear from Dr. Murad, though, I'd like to invite Barry Collins, the executive director of the UVA Medical Alumni Association, to come forward. On behalf of the Medical Alumni Association, Mr. Collins will be presenting Dr. Murad with the Walter Reed Award, named for one of UVA's most accomplished medical graduates. You'll also find in your handout a more complete biographical sketch of Dr. Murad. Barry. Thank you, Marcia. Um, each year, the Medical Alumni Association proudly presents the Walter Reed Award to a distinguished alumnus or fa former faculty member of the School of Medicine. The committee is made up of uh, past recipients, which include um, Dr. Harry Muller, Dan Muller, John Owen, Muncie Weeby, Sharon Hostler, George Beller, and Vivian Penn. I am honored today to present this award, in addition to all the other accolades and accomplishments that Dr. Murad had, uh, on behalf of the University of Virginia Medical Alumni Association and School of Medicine. So, Dr. Murad, I'd like to present you with our award today. In addition to Dr. Murad's award today, we're also presenting him with the traditional Jefferson Cup, which would be most important. Thank you, Dr. Murad. Well, I, uh, I 
I've been back to uh, Virginia, the UVA, perhaps four or five times over the past, uh, I guess, what, like 27 or 8 years that I've left. I left in 1981 to go to Stanford. Uh, so I have been back a few times. The last was perhaps four or five years ago to give some lectures. <clears throat> and it's always a treat to come back and see lots of friends and see Charlottesville. It's absolutely gorgeous. Certainly when you compare it to Houston. It's <laughs> horrible weather in the summer and it's flatness. It just doesn't compare. Uh, I'm going to, uh, because it's a very mixed audience, I was told that there could be people from the community, people from the other schools and the university, as well as uh, some scientists here in the medical school. Uh, it always makes it a little bit more difficult, and I want to be able to reach all of you so that you leave with something. Uh, my mentor, Joe Larder, the chairman of pharmacology when I was here, uh, always told me that everybody in the audience ought to learn something before they leave one of your talks, and I believe in that. Uh, so I've divided this up into three pieces. The first will be a short video, about ten and a half minutes or so, uh, and I'll tell you why we made that shortly. The second will be something about the Nobel Foundation <clears throat> and the process. As you've heard, the prizes were announced just this past week. It's always the first full week of October, the first full week that has a Monday in it, uh, and about two months before the awards. And the awards ceremonies take place primarily in Stockholm and the Peace Prize in Oslo, because it was part of the Scandinavian countries at that point in time, very close allies. Um, and it occurs on December 10th of every year, the anniversary of Alfred Nobel's death. And why is that? Because that's when the foundation was created, when Alfred Nobel died and left his, most of his estate to create the foundation. Um, after the prize was announced in early October of 98, my office began to get many, many phone calls from all of the local schools, middle schools, high schools, colleges, uh, as well as the churches and the mosques, and everybody wanted me to come and talk to young people. And I did a lot of that. It was, it was a bit overwhelming, but I tried to keep up with it and talk to lots of young people. And it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. But I realized that I just couldn't keep doing what I was doing <laughs> and do that all the time. So I went to the television department in the medical center. And the, Texas Medical Center is huge. It's the largest medical center in the world, with a couple of medical schools, a public health school, a nursing school. It's big. And because of that, they have a television department to service all these folks. And what they do often is prepare educational materials for patients, uh, how to monitor or manage your shunt for renal dialysis, how to manage your ileostomy bag, et cetera, et cetera. So I checked with the Vice President of Education in the medical school who was interested in K-12 through programs with some federal funding and I said, can we do something and make a video? And he said, absolutely, let's go talk to them. So we did and they got all excited about it because this was very different from what they usually had done. We had a series of meetings <coughs> where I expressed what I would like to accomplish in this, uh, that I wanted some students young students between 13 and 15 years old to participate in this. I wanted to make sure that we had a mixture of ethnic groups and colors so that we wouldn't be accused of any biases. Uh, and that we wanted to teach them something about the Nobel Prize, what it's all about, how does the process work, and uh, what was I awarded the prize for? What does it mean? And so we did this with dialogue back and forth, back and forth, and I edited the scripts. And ultimately, after a few months of this, they showed up at my house on a Saturday morning with several young students, which you'll see in the video. Uh, and we did the video over about a three or four hour period in my family room. They went back and cut and pasted and brought in some professional actors as well, and we prepared this 10 and a half minute video. I have shown this video all over the world. Uh, it's, I've shown it to people as young as four or five, six years old. Uh, my grandson at the time was four. He memorized all the lines. I'll tell you some cute stories about this later on. 
as to how he went to the library and asked the librarian for a book on nitric oxide. She didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> he went to the dentist, or he went to the doctor to have his tonsils taken out, and the doctor said, I'm going to give you nitrous oxide. He said, no, you mean nitric oxide. <laughs> well, it was nitrous, nitrous oxide. Uh, but I've also shown it to people in their mid to late 80s at one of the country clubs for a breakfast meeting. A group of retirees would often be for breakfast, and the organizer that year of the meeting of the speakers uh, was with one of the local foundations who gave me a very generous endowed chair. And I couldn't turn him down, so I went and talked. And with, these were retired lawyers, doctors, engineers, uh, all sorts of people. And I showed the video because I, the other video I took was malfunctioning. It wouldn't work. So I went to my brief and said, what do I do now? Uh, I wanted to show him something about the Institute and all the research programs. So I pulled out the children's video and showed them that and they loved it. So uh, lots of people have seen it. And we'll start with that and then I'll tell you something about the foundation and the prize process. Uh, and then I'll turn at the end to just a few slides, very general slides. I will avoid a lot of the biochemistry in detail, but I'll give you a flavor for this field, uh, where it's going. And it's been absolutely remarkable. It's so exciting to see it just expand all over the place. So let's start with the video. Yep. And then we'll have some questions, the answers hopefully at the end. The video? And the winner is... And the winner is... And the winner is... Gosh, what's with all the award shows? Congratulations, and I now ask you to step forward to receive your Nobel Prizes. Nobel Prize? What's that? Beats me. What? You don't know what the Nobel Prize is? You're going to have to do something about that. Whoa! What's up with this? <laughs> the dude's coming out of the TV. It's like alien. May I? Yeah, sure, why not? So, uh, what's your story? Well, my name is Farid Murad, you call me Fred. I'm a doctor and a researcher and a scientist at the University of Texas Houston Medical School. And oh, by the way, I got the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1998. So, what is the Nobel Prize, anyway? Well, the Nobel Prize is one of the greatest awards you can get in the world. Uh -huh. It's recognition from other scientists. So? Hmm. Well, you get to be on TV all over the world. There's a big party in Sweden. You even get to meet the king and queen of Sweden. You get a gold medal. And then, of course, there's the money. Money? Party? Royalty? Yeah! Maybe it'd be better if I show you. May I? Uh, sure. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Fred. Welcome to my world of science and my laboratory. <laughs> you know, the Nobel Prize wouldn't even be around if it weren't for... Dynamite. Anyway. Alfred Nobel, the Swedish inventor and businessman who created the Nobel Prizes, was the guy that created dynamite. Nitroglycerin is the explosive chemical in dynamite. And even though it was very dangerous, Mr. Nobel figured out a way to contain nitroglycerin so that it could be put to good use, like to build stuff. You could say his discovery rocked the world. But nitroglycerin has other uses. When Nobel started having heart problems, his doctor actually prescribed nitroglycerin for his heart. But Nobel said, no way. So he blew it. He figured anything that can blow stuff up can't be good for your heart. Nobody knew why it worked, but it did. 100 years later, Dr. Murad stopped to ask why nitroglycerin helps chest pain. And he shared the 1998 Nobel Prize in Medicine with Dr. Robert Furchgott and Dr. Louis Ignaro for figuring it out. 
So you're the dude that figured out why nitroglycerin help people's hearts? Well, yeah. So? So what? So why does it work? We were trying to answer the question as to how nitroglycerin works to help with chest pain. I did experiments, observed the results, and collected data. Then I found out if what I thought was right or wrong. Anyway, what I did find was that nitroglycerin releases nitric oxide, and that nitric oxide does a lot of important stuff in the body. So what is nitric oxide, and what exactly did you figure out about it that got you this Nobel Prize? Let me show you. It protects the heart, it stimulates the brain, it kills bacteria, and it's a real gas. It's nitric, nitric oxide. No one can say no to N-O. <laughs> nitric oxide, or N-O, is a simple molecule with two atoms, nitrogen and oxygen. And yes, it's a colorless, odorless gas. scientific sensation sweeps the globe. Nitric oxide is everywhere. This common and toxic pollutant depletes the ozone layer. It's even found in car exhaust and cigarette smoke. But from supermenace to superhero, nitric oxide is also found inside the human body and can help send very important messages, which are not from our sponsors. When blood flows through your blood vessels, the inner lining or endothelium releases nitric oxide. The nitric oxide signals your blood vessel to relax and widen. So, what? This in turn lowers blood pressure, the force which the blood exerts on the vessel walls. If your blood vessels make enough nitric oxide to signal your blood vessels to relax, then your blood flows on through no problem. But if blood doesn't flow through, blood clots form. Then. So, relaxed blood vessels allow more blood to flow, and nitric oxide can have an impact on all different parts of the body. For example, nitric oxide is already saving the lives of babies who were born too early. By breathing in very small doses of this gas, it helps their lungs and improves their breathing. And that's good! In nerve cells, nitric oxide can stimulate the brain, affecting things like behavior. Oh, behave, baby. As part of the body's self-defense mechanism, nitric oxide defends against tumor cells and bacteria, too. It's amazing stuff. But nitric oxide is no laughing matter, and not to be confused with nitrous oxide, better known as laughing gas. <laughs> Somebody turn off that gas. <laughs> so how do you think of all that anyway? Well, over time, I became very interested in how cells talk to each other. But most other scientists didn't think that was very important. Dr. Murad figured out that when cells talk to each other, it's like one cell sends an email to another cell somewhere in the body. And the email is the gas nitric oxide. The email can break into another cell and take over how the other cell works. It may contain a message, like instructions for a blood vessel to relax. Ah. Or it may contain some other type of instructions. For example, if the message is being sent to a cancer cell, the nitric oxide may kill the cancer and then self-destruct. Hasta la vista, baby. Nitric oxide in your body affects so many things. It's like having a worldwide internet system inside your own body. So why did you go into science in the first place? Well, it's really a lot of fun to figure out how stuff like this works. And you don't have to be brilliant to get ahead. You just have to have some goals and be prepared to work very hard. As a scientist, you get to do something for the first time that nobody else has ever done, and that's exciting. Sometimes your discovery opens the door to a whole new way of thinking, and even more new discoveries. It's really cool. It's kind of like the Science Olympics, and the gold is the Nobel Prize. 
teams of scientists around the world compete with each other. It's fun. Who's going to finish first? Who's going to win the prize? One of you could be a Nobel Prize winner someday. Who knows? Hey, I had some more questions. Yeah, me too. But I guess we'll have to find out more on our own. Maybe we can check the internet. Yeah, and look up science and the Nobel Prize. They're gone, and they left some popcorn, didn't they? Yum. Coming in, Toxy Pulp. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, it was it was fun to make. It was cute. The kids love it. The elderly folks love it. They learned something, I hope. Um, and I really thought that there ought to be a series of these sorts of things. And if I ever had the time, I'd convince a lot of other Nobel laureates to do such a thing, make a package of these, maybe for, you know, Nova or one of the educational channels or who knows what. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> the prizes were announced last week, as I told you. And, uh, the foundation was created as a result of Alfred Nobel's death, December 10th, 1896. Before he had died, he wrote a handwritten will saying that he wanted the major portion of his estate to go to create this new foundation and new group of prizes. And there were six prizes that uh, he established. I think five or six, seven, five. Uh, Medicine, physiology was one prize, uh, chemistry a second, physics a third, literature a fourth, uh, and peace was the fifth. Uh, and along came the Swedish Bank in 1967 and supplemented the corpus of the foundation to create a prize in economics. The prize in economics is not a Nobel Prize. It often is called a Nobel Prize, but it's a prize uh, administered and supervised by the Nobel Foundation, so it's sort of the equivalent. But what is apparent is that the will of Alfred Nobel will never be modified. They will not be prizes in other categories, in spite of all the criticisms. You know, why wasn't there a prize in mathematics? Why isn't there a prize in lots of other disciplines that would be today, perhaps? Well, they won't deviate from that will. And in his handwritten will, he specified the different re group, review groups that would make the decisions to select the recipient. And there could be no more than three recipients in any one category. One, two, or three, but no more than three. Uh, <coughs> he donated, I think, $9 million to start the foundation. Uh, there were protests from family members and others about this. We thought that he left, he was very generous. He left his partners and friends a lot of money, his family members, his sister and a brother a lot of money, but they were concerned that it wasn't enough and they protested. But fortunately, he had a very talented Indian secretary administrator who was very loyal to him. Uh, and he managed to weave through this whole litigation process and everything else. And after five years of back and forth and negotiations and lawsuits, uh, the whole corpus of $9 million ended up in the hands of the foundation and it was created. And the first award was in 1901, 108 years ago. Uh, <coughs> He specified as to who would be the review groups for each of these categories. The Norwegian legislature is allowed to appoint five or six members to pick the Peace Prize. The Academy of Arts picks the Literature Prize. The Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, picks the Chemistry Physics Prize. And the Karolinska University and Institute picks the Medicine Physiology Prize. Uh, the Literature Prize is comprised of uh, about 11 or 12 members of that society. 
the legislature in Oslo is only five or six members. Uh, of course, the Academy of Sciences is a bigger group for chemistry physics. And the Karolinska, which I know best, has two committees, a central committee with about six members, uh, and a group of, called the Assembly of 50 senior professors in the Karolinska, who remain basically on that committee until they <coughs> retire. So the turnover is, is very minimal. And, and I'll tell you how the process works as I best know it for medicine physiology. Uh, in the fall of each year, the committee foundation will send out nomination forms to all of the previous Nobel laureates in that category and a list of invitees and that rotates uh, directors of the NIH, uh, senior research scientists at various prominent universities around the world. Uh, and they'll send out maybe six or seven hundred of these forms and we'll probably get back about 150, 170 nominations due February 1st of each year. Uh, now, many of the nominations are repetitive. Uh, people get nominated over and over and over again. I, that was my case. Almost all of us are. Uh, it's common in the sciences to have done the work 10, 15, 20 years before you get the prize. Uh, that's not true in economics, literature, and some of the other areas. You know, usually they occur, peace, they occur pretty quickly, within a few years. <coughs> um, the committee then uh, starts reviewing this list of nominations. The rules are that the recipient should be nominated in the year in which they receive it. If they're not, they may not get it. So the committee, however, has the option to nominate somebody that sort of slipped through the cracks. So they can come back and submit another nomination if they think that that is really deserving for a review. Uh, they're allowed to call upon members of the Karolinska to review the nominations. They can even call upon outside people as consultants, advisors, if they wish. Uh, and they will narrow this down over the course of months to a short list of three or four categories and maybe several individuals in each of those categories. The first Monday in October, the assembly and the central committee votes. And at the end of the vote, the secretary of the foundation gets on the phone and calls the recipients. Well, they often finish the meeting in Stockholm about 11 o'clock in the morning. So the phone calls you get are about four o'clock five o'clock in the morning, depending where you are in what country. Uh, and my phone call is four o'clock in the morning. And I was sort of expecting this could happen for several years. Why was that? Well, because a couple of years prior to that, I had received the Lasker Award for Basic Research. And approximately 50% of the basic research recipients for the Lasker go on to get the Nobel Prizes in Physiology and Medicine. It's rather cool. The other thing, a bit of information, is that the majority of all the science awards since the, the post-war II era have been Americans. It's not surprising because of the huge investments that the U.S. has made in research and science and education compared to other countries. Other countries are now trying to catch up and in investing heavily. They're, when I travel, they say, you know, why aren't there more Nobel laureates in China or Japan or wherever? And said it's because you guys didn't invest way back. And now they're doing it. So that's going to change. And I, in fact, am very concerned that in the future, perhaps another 20 years from now, we won't be the technology science leaders that we have been for the last few decades. I'm very concerned about that. And we need to uh, make greater investments in research and education. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Alfred Nobel. His father was sort of a self-made chemical engineer, if you will, who made landmines. And he made a lot of money, but he lost a lot of money. And his landmines were being sold to Russia for some of the wars that Russia had. Uh, so Alfred Nobel, two brothers and a sister, grew up in this environment. The family was pretty prosperous with his father's business. Uh, he was educated in multiple places, Paris, St. Petersburg, Italy. 
Uh, and he later had homes in various places and fell in love with primarily Italy, where he ultimately died. Um, but he, nitroglycerin was first synthesized by Italian chemists in the 1840s. And as chemists will do, when they make a compound, you know, they taste it. <laughs> I don't know why they do that, but they do. And they discovered that when they taste it, they got a vascular headache, vasodilatation, like a migraine. Well, this then led others to think about the possibility of using this for chest pain, angina pectoris. And sure enough, in the 1870s, it was introduced as treatment for angina. And it was used for 100 years for angina, not knowing how it worked, uh, until we came along in the 1970s here in Virginia and figured it out. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Uh, but Alfred Nobel <clears throat> decided that he would work with nitroglycerin because of its explosive properties. However, it was too explosive to make it in large quantities. So he figured out that if he mixed it with a diatomaceous earth like a clay, he could make dynamite, which you can throw on the floor and kick it or whatever. It won't blow up until you detonate it with a cap or a light of and blow it up, OK? And he made an awful lot of money making dynamite and selling it all over the world for tunnels, roads, silver mines, gold mines, et cetera, et cetera. And this was all in the late 1800s. Um, why did he get interested in the Nobel Prize concept? I don't think anybody knows. Uh, he wrote that handwritten will very late, the last year or two of his life, actually. Uh, he had angina. He was prescribed nitroglycerin. Because his factory workers got headaches working with nitroglycerin, and it absorbed topically. We use topical uh, nitroglycerin salves and things like that all the time. He wouldn't take it. He didn't want the headaches because of the side effects, so he refused. He didn't die with a heart attack. He died with a very major stroke. You know, he died in 1896. Um, was never married. He had no children to speak of. But he did have a young friend who he looked after. Not thought to be a lover, but you never know. And he took care of her. In fact, he bought her clothes. And, jewelry and paid her for her apartment in Paris and things like that. But ultimately, she left him, returned to Vienna, and married a police officer or somebody in the military. Uh, so there's some really interesting books about Alfred Nobel that I've gone through when I have time to learn the history. Uh, but what a concept it was. And I'm sure he had no idea what he was accomplishing by having done this. But if you look at that today, that $9 million is probably about $350 million or so, I think. Uh, rather modest amount of money in terms of its impact on educational research all over the world and motivating young people and scientists. Uh, so it was quite an influence. Uh, probably much more so than you know, creating research grants at the time. <laughs> Who knows? Um, so there we are. Uh, I think the, uh, the Nobel Prizes end up changing your life. Um, I've been told, my wife has been told, that sometimes it changes it for wonderful, beneficial things. Uh, there are other times where it's created some very serious problems. Uh, because all of the means, and you get requests to do all sorts of stuff. Uh, and you can't keep up with it. It's exhausting. I'm working harder now than I've ever worked in my life because I still have a very active research program. Uh, and I'm trying to juggle all these balls and do this and, still, and travel too much and lecture all over the world. And I turn down lots of things, but it's very hard to turn down things, particularly if they're requests from friends or previous trainees. You know, so a trainee has a meeting in, in Australia or Japan or wherever. They want you to come. Now, the other thing that happens is that you're splattered all over the media and all over the internet, and everybody knows everything about you. Uh, we are all required to have autobiographies, as we're talking about, 
that autobiography is published along with our lecture, and it's signed. I have found companies lifting that signature out of that book, putting on their products and promoting products. Yeah, and uh, that's not appropriate. It's not fair. <laughs> it's illegal. Uh, but that's what they do. So lots of people out there pointing games. I've had to sue several companies. I've had to write nasty letters to others to get them to stop doing this. Um, anyway, so it comes with a lot of fame and excitement, but it comes with a lot of grief and agony as well. Uh, so let me now show you a little bit of data. I call it soft science. I'm only going to hit the, the highlights and the pathways for you. And then we'll have some questions and answers. So if we could, are there any questions at this point or we can come back to it, whatever you'd like to do. Okay. Um, let me tell you that there are, since 1901, approximately 750 Nobel laureates. And currently about 180 or so living. Um, all over the world. Uh, but the U.S., as I said, has a huge complement, more, more than most places. Let's see the, uh, the slides. Okay, I'm going to advance some of these now. We're just going to be selective here. This sort of was the email thing that you saw in the video. These are cells talking to each other and how molecules are made by one cell Earl Sutherland called them the first messengers. We give them other names today. They're called hormones, neurotransmitters, autocoids, paraffin substances, growth factors, cytokines, a variety of names. Uh, and what they do is they home in the body to go find a target, interacting with a protein in that cell surface we call a receptor. And that's where the specificity of the interaction takes place. To often result in the accumulation of an intracellular messenger molecule. Sutherland called them second messengers. Um, and there are a handful of these. There, there are hundreds and hundreds of first messengers and a modest number of intracellular second messengers, perhaps 79 so far. And there'll be a few more, I'm sure. Uh, and many of them have resulted in Nobel Prizes in the past. Well, nitric oxide is one of these messengers, and it does lots of things. It not only works in the cell in which it's made, but it comes out very easily and readily to go to adjacent cells or distant cells, so it functions also as a, a local paracrine substance, or it can be called a hormone to go to a distant cell type and regulate it as well. Uh, and in this case, it's going over to the smooth muscle cells in the blood vessel to cause cyclic GMP production uh, and relaxation. This discovery of cyclic GMP was occurring uh, in the mid-1960s, it stimulated research in a few laboratories. This was going on about the time I was doing my postdoc at NIH, uh, where laboratories got excited about cyclic GMP, a cousin of cyclic GMP, as another potential messenger molecule, and started looking for enzymes that made it, enzymes that inactivated it, and enzymes that might be targets for mediating various biological effects. And sure enough, uh, there were enzymes called guanylocyclases that made it. And there are about seven or eight isoforms of this. And I spent my life chasing these enzymes, purifying, cloning, and understanding the regulation. Uh, and they're very homologous in their catalytic domain with that nylate cyclase, which makes cyclic AMP another important message. Uh, and the soluble guanylate cyclase is the target we discovered for nitric oxide, and I'll say a little bit more about that. The cyclic nucleotides are inactivated by a family of enzymes called cyclic nucleotide phosphodiesterases that hydrolyze the phosphodiester bond to fake, make the corresponding monophosphate in its inactive. There are 11 gene products or members of this family. The one that you all know about, you don't know what you know about it, is the type 5 phosphodiesterase which is found predominantly in the wall of blood vessels, basically all blood vessels, and it hydrolyzes specifically cyclic GMP. That type 5 phosphodiesterase is the target for Viagra. 
So Viagra came out on the market about the year before I got the prize. That, of course, sort of stimulated the field. The Nobel Committee, I'm sure, to think about this. Uh, I think that Viagra research was sort of trivial, frankly. Uh, when I travel, I'm all, often called the father of Viagra. I hate that term. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a story in a moment about that. Because I think I've done things more important than the associated with Viagra. But the concept of Viagra came out of my research that I had done here in Charlottesville. And that came later, not by me, but by Pfizer and other laboratories. Um, but all of these messengers often regulate a protein kinase that phosphorylates a variety of proteins in the cell, and that's how they cause their biological effects. Okay? Now, I don't want to get into a lot of detailed biochemistry and illusion, but this is the, the concept of signaling, and I've been involved with this forever, as well as Larger and other people here, Ted Rawl, who is one of my mentors, uh, and has been retired. Uh, it's been a fun area that is just going and growing and expanding. Uh, and it's been, this whole field of signaling has been so responsible for lots of awards, and, you know, not just Nobel Prizes, but other things as well. Uh, won't advance. There we go. I'm going to skip a few. Why don't you go to this one? One of the questions I wanted to ask and answer when I came to Charlottesville from the NIH, and as this field was evolving, was how do hormones regulate guanamycyclase in production of cyclic GMP? If I understood the precise molecular mechanism, perhaps I could come along with drugs to facilitate that coupling mechanism or block it as therapeutic agents for various endocrine disorders. That was my thinking at the time. Well, it turned out that hormones did increase cyclic GMP, but only in intact cells. It made the problem much more difficult. And along the way, as we worked with one way cyclase making cyclic GMP, we accidentally, as often happens, discovered that some other interesting molecules would activate the enzyme. Simple things like sodium azide, hydroxylamine, sodium nitride. And we said, my goodness, if we understand how they're activating, maybe we will be clever enough to reconstitute a hormone effect in cell-free systems to get back to what we really would like to do. Well, it, it was like a detective story, and we looked and looked and looked, and we put these agents on smooth muscle cells, and, uh, strips at the time that we were working with. I thought that the smooth muscle was going to be contracted by cyclic GMP. Well, that was not the case. When we put these substances on smooth muscles, they relaxed as cyclic GMP levels went up. 180 degrees different from what we were thinking. Total accident, serendipity. That's so much of this whole field of science. And it turned out that these substances were really useful agents to understand the role of cyclic GMP in smooth muscle relaxation. Not in just the airway, but GI smooth muscle and subsequently in vascular smooth muscle. So we said, wow, this is interesting. Cyclic GMP is a smooth muscle relaxant. Let's test other smooth muscle relaxants. Well, because of my clinical experience working in ICUs and having given a lot of patients nitroglycerin and nitroprusside, I said, let's test those substances. Sure enough, they activated quite a cyclase. And the mystery story got solved rather quickly. And all of these compounds turned out to be prodrugs or precursors that were converted to nitric oxide in their incubations. Why did we suspect nitric oxide? Well, it's because we purified an inhibitor out of tissues that turned out to be hemoglobin. We knew about the history of hemoglobin binding nitric oxide and carbon monoxide, so we tested nitric oxide, and sure enough, it activated the enzyme. And that was an exciting day, December 1976, I'll always remember it, where we showed that a free radical from gas could activate an enzyme. It had never been demonstrated before. And I really recognize the importance and the fun that this is going to be to figure out the chemistry and use it as a, a tool. And uh, that sort of took us in a lot of directions at that point. We proposed in a subsequent review article, a couple actually, that nitroglycerin worked by being converted to nitric oxide. And that's how smooth muscle relaxes. 
and that's the mechanism. We also said if nitric oxide is responsible for nitroglycerin effects, could it be responsible for hormonal regulation of cyclic GMP production? And therefore, could it be an intracellular messenger molecule? That was heresy. A free radical activating an enzyme was a big surprise. Most people sort of put their tongue in their cheek and said, well, I don't know. But then we said it's a second messenger present normally in tissues. Wow, that was heresy. We turned out to be right. But it took a few more years to prove it, as things often go, because the concentrations required were just so low that we couldn't measure them until we developed new technology. Let me try to summarize this a little bit. This is a smooth muscle, vascular smooth muscle cartoon with an endothelial lining and a smooth muscle compartment in the wall of the blood vessel. And in red are three categories of drugs that will increase cyclic GMP synthesis. And all of these drugs are vasodilators. The nitro vasodilators get converted to nitric oxide, some enzymatically, some spontaneously. They activate guanine cyclase, make cyclic G. That activates the kinase to phosphorylate a lot of proteins, some of which are associated with relaxation. And I won't go into the details. There are other drugs that only work in the presence of the endothelium. They're called endothelial dependent vasodilators. And the reason that you require endothelium is because those are the cells with the receptors. The smooth muscle don't have receptors for those hormones and drugs. That was Furchgott's discovery. And he gave that lecture here at UBA in the spring of 1980 while I was still here. And I was so excited because there was a substance coming out of the endothelial cells that he called endothelial derived relaxant factor that was very labile. It had a half-life of a few seconds. And I cornered him afterwards. I took him off to my office in the old medical school building and said, Bob, this is going to be a free radical or some reactive species, maybe related to nitric oxide, but I'm sure it's going to work through cyclic G. And sure enough, it did. Uh, we proposed to collaborate, but we never ended up collaborating because I moved to Stanford. His wife developed cancer, and he was distracted for some period of time. So these endothelial dependent beta dilators produce EDRF, endothelial derived relaxant factor, which turns out to be nitric oxide. And that then moves over to the smooth muscle, makes cyclic G, the cascades turn on, the smooth muscle relaxes. The third category are the atrial peptides. These are peptides produced initially in cardiac atria, but now in other tissues as well. They activate the particulate isoforms of one cyclones. And there are about six of these particulate isoforms. And these are receptor cyclases, with the receptor domain on the outside, transmembrane span and the catalytic domain on the inside. So they too make cyclic G, they cause relaxation. I'm gonna, I don't wanna get into too much detail for you. But anyway, by beating on this problem and doing a lot of biochemistry, a lot of purification, a lot of cloning, we were able to put the pathway together from start to finish. We went from the receptor through the nitric oxide production to the, the cyclase activation to the protein kinase activation and even identified proteins in smooth muscle that were altered when phosphorylation was occurring. Now, why is that important? Because if you understand the detail of the pathways, every step along the way becomes a molecular target that you might be able to manipulate with a drug by either stimulating or inhibiting, and they become potential therapeutic agents. And that's the way to discover drugs. It's sort of a rational approach to drug discovery, and not accidental, where you give compounds to mice or rats or whatever to look at what are some spots. It is a very inefficient way to do it. Uh, so rational drug discovery, you define the pathway, now you come back and screen compounds look for agents that influence each of those steps. This whole process is very important in a syndrome that we call endothelial dysfunction. 
patients with hypertension, atherosclerosis, diabetes, tobacco use, and perhaps obesity have endothelial dysfunction. Their blood vessels do not make enough nitric oxide. And they don't make enough nitric oxide for several reasons. They're making an arginine analog that turns out to be an inhibitor of the pathway. And they're also creating a lot of reactive oxygen species, free radicals, that oxidize the cofactors required to make nitric oxide from its substrate, arginine. So by understanding this now, we can begin to think, okay, now this understand, this begins to explain why red wine might be beneficial, right, with its antioxidants, or why vitamin E might be useful. Can we use these as supplemental therapy in some of these disorders? Uh, and I think that's turning out to be true, but a lot more work needs to be done, uh, because while the animal data looks good, the clinical data are not so tight and uh, convincing at the moment. Is it because they were done incorrectly? I don't know. Uh, but there are some, some problems. This field of nitric oxide research has gone absolutely bananas. Our first report was in 1977 here at UVA. Since 1977, there are more than 110,000 publications in the field of nitric oxide research. 110,000. Almost as many as cholesterol. Almost. Really, cholesterol is ahead of us. But more than psycho-GMP or psycho-GMP or cheap proteins. Uh, it has just gone crazy. And in every direction of biology, from plants to lower forms to the primates to man. Uh, and it's going to turn out to be very useful <coughs> in helping understand and perhaps treating a number of diseases. And Here's a partial list of some of the things where it's going. We keep track of some of this. We can't keep track of all of it, obviously. If I, you know, 110,000 papers with uh, probably five to 10,000 a year means that about 20 papers a day. I don't think anybody can keep up with that. But it still have very, you know, do the other things you do. Um, but it plays a role in just basically all areas of biology, the blood pressure regulation, uh, neuroscience, it's a neurotransmitter, uh, pulmonary hypertension, you saw the nitric oxide inhalation of premature babies to decrease the shunting by dilating the pulmonary vessels. It plays a role in stem cell development. By manipulating nitric oxide and cycle G in embryonic stem cells, we can make them become heart cell or neuronal cells. It's sort of fun. Uh, it regulates a variety of genes. It plays a role in wound healing. Uh, it just goes on and on. It's, it's exciting. Uh, a lot of fun. So that's where we are. Uh, and I'll be happy to try to address some questions. We can talk about the video or the Nobel Foundation or research, whatever you want. Okay, we have some time for your comments and questions, and I'll ask you please to identify yourself when you ask your question. Fred? Yes. Uh, uh, John Owen, I want you to know, and I'm sure it goes without saying, that we at EBA are tremendously proud of the uh, reflected glory we have achieved from having had you do your work of such importance at this institution. Now, my personal opinion is that you could have gone to any medical school in the country, perhaps in the world, and you would have found it an opportunity to do the same work, maybe even faster. But on the other hand, I know that you have been consulted by many medical schools who have not produced a Nobel laureate, and they may have asked you, what's the secret that a medical school has to know in order to have uh, great science come from it? What's your answer to questions like that? Well, I, you know, John, I think you've got to have the resources and the talent. And most of the talent comes from young people working with you. Uh, you know, the space that we worked in was pretty grubby old space. <laughs> I concluded that that probably doesn't matter. You know, the, the quality of the space, as long as you've got enough to get everybody accommodated to do your work. Uh, and the other, of course, is the environment. I mean, to have people like Warner 
maybe the faculty of pharmacology and medicine interact with them is very, very important. You know, test ideas. You know, whether they're right or wrong, it's the fact that you got somebody to listen to what you're doing and give you some feedback. Tell you that's stupid when you're at or that's interesting when you're at or whatever. It's a combination of things, Joe. And a lot of it is serendipity and luck. No doubt about it. You know, you stumble into something and you say, wow, should I go this way with it or should I go over here with it? And at the time, you really don't know which way to go. So you, you sort of take, smell along the way and figure it out. Like an old town dog. <laughs> I'm Bob Chevalier in pediatrics. I enjoyed your talk and your movie and uh, got me to thinking of uh, what you feel the role is of scientists, uh, particularly in America, in explaining science to the public and to children, to youth. I'm concerned that the current uh, numbers suggest that over half of Americans don't believe the evolutionary theory is, is uh, valid. Uh, and how you think America can maintain its preeminence in science uh, without more efforts of scientists to, to disseminate this to the public? Yeah. Good questions. Um, one, I think to maintain our leadership, and I told you I'm concerned that we might be slipping, uh, we've got to just continue to invest very, very heavily in education at all levels, and certainly in the early years, because that's when people are influenced. <coughs> it was between the ages of probably 8 and 12 and 13 that you really get people turned on about science or whatever. Uh, later on, it's almost too late. Uh, but we've got to invest more heavily in research, and for the past decade, we've slipped an awful lot. You know, we doubled the NIH budget, that was wonderful, but they don't realize the problems that that has created now, because it hasn't increased since. We've got a big pool of young people who are struggling to survive and get funded, uh, and becoming very, very discouraged, which is sad. Uh, and I think that we have a responsibility as teachers and scientists uh, to really educate people, the public, uh, because they're providing the dollars to do what we do. There are very <coughs> few professions who have, I think, as much fun as we do. Uh, have you ever met a lawyer who's excited about going to work? I haven't. <laughs> How about a businessman, a CEO? Uh, I think it's fun.